So this is our third message in this series that we've entitled, I Love My Church. We talked about communion together. This morning it's about serving. Serving. Let me begin by asking you, what is the church? If you were to go to the internet and type in church definition, here's what you would discover. Here's what I found. The church, common definition is, it's a building used for public Christian worship. Can I say that that is not the correct definition? Now, you may say I'm splitting hairs, and maybe I am. But it really isn't the correct definition of the church. You do not, I was going to say, attend Calvary Temple. You do. But actually, more than that is you are Calvary Temple. And we meet at 620 34th Street. So before we're a building, before we gather here, we have to realize that we are the church. So when someone says, what is the church doing for that need? We ask ourselves, what are you doing for that need? Right? Because we are the church. Now, the word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means called out ones. It means an assembly. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 5, Paul refers to, quote, the church that meets at their house. The church that meets at their house. It's more like what people do you associate and mingle with? The church is a body of believers. So the question is not what is the church, but rather who is the church? So the church is you and I. So when we say, and we've been saying it for some time now, we love the church, we are very much saying that we love our people. We love people. We love the association. We love our brothers and sisters. We love the body of Christ. We love what the church stands for. We love what the church represents. And we love what the church is capable of doing. The church is capable of changing its world. One by one by one by one, they can be one to Jesus. The church. Very, very, very unique and special. The church is alive because of active participants. We are doers for the kingdom. The church is not just a sit-in, although we are seated. <laughs> but the church is not just a sit-in, where we kind of sing kumbaya, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, no, we, we are active participants. We are doers. The church is a movement. The church is a be. The church is not a noun. The church is a verb. The church is an, I want to say it's an anthill. You ever watch an anthill? What a lot of activity takes place. On an anthill. And I've watched ants at work. It looks like organized chaos to me at times, but there they are going here and there, and they're carrying things that are twice their size. Watch them. It's a hub of activity, it's a hill of activity. And that is what the church ought to be a, a hill of activity. Lots of things taking place, a beehive, so to speak. Every person who calls Calvary Temple their church home has a role. Every person who calls Calvary Temple their church family has something to contribute. And so today, I am looking at superheroes. And today, I'm looking at superheroes who have superpowers. Now, let me set it up by saying this. You and I have all grown up with superheroes. You remember back in the 50s? I don't remember. I wasn't born then. Zorro. Remember Zorro? That masked, who was that masked man? <laughs> He's gone. Remember Zorro? Remember Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman. Remember Spider-Man? Spider-Man, Spider-Man. That was all I remember. And then there's Superman. There was the Invisible Man. And then, of course, there was the Green Hornet. There was the Bionic Man followed by the Bionic Woman. There was the Incredible Hulk who would, everything would, clothes would rip and he would, I always wonder why he ran so slow though. But anyways, 
in slow motion. Then there's the newer ones. There's Power Rangers, there's the Terminator, and I like to put in there the Rocky series, just because I think that I really like that show. Adrian, Adrian! How that man could come back in his 80s and, and take on a 25-year-old guy and, and, and beat him was a miracle to me. Well, I'm stretching it a bit, but you know, like he should have retired. Anyhow, but I put Rocky in there too. You know, heroes, superheroes. They, my favorite of all time as a little boy growing up in Truro, Nova Scotia on 64 Rexdale Drive was the Cape Crusader and the Boy Wonder, Batman and Robin. That was my favorite. Once a week in the evening, that show would come on, and I'd watch it. After that show was over, then I'd go out and play with my friends, you know, pow, you know, bam. Now, some of you younger ones don't even know what I'm talking about. That's what it was. You'd see, ouch, pain, <laughs> hurt. But I would be like, I wanted to be like Batman and Robin. Each week was a cliffhanger. At the end of that, I think it was a half-hour show, the announcer would come on and say, stay tuned. Next week, the same bad station, the same bad time, the same bad channel. And then I had to go to the bat room and then the bedroom, have a bat sleep. I had Batman cars. I had bat hats, bat gloves. I had bat my bedroom was the cave. I love Batman and Robin. That was my personal favorite. And the boy wonder, what is a superhero? What really is a superhero? We get that from, you know, a, a really, let's, let's look at the definition that they, that I found on the internet. A superhero is a type of costumed heroic character who possesses supernatural or superhuman powers and who is dedicated to fighting crime, protecting the public, and usually battling supervillains. That's what they say on the internet. Superheroes, they say have gifts, strengths, and abilities, and they used to help in specific ways. Batman and Robin were always fighting to same, save Gotham City. Never seen much about Gotham City, but I knew that they were out to save it. And poor Commissioner Gordon, they were trying to save him. He caught himself, he, he's caught in many different things, and they have to save him and save the city. Boy, you know, I... Remember some of the villains? There was the Joker. I'm taking you way back. And some of you think, I don't know, what are you talking about, you younger? Just stick with us. We'll teach you some things, us, us older saints of God. There was, the, there was the, the Riddler. There was Mr. Freeze. <laughs> and there was the Penguin. Remember? There was Catwoman. There was the Puzzler. Now, some that I don't re remember, but I've discovered these were also some of the villains. Clock, the Clock King, the Mad Hatter, and the False Face, and the Archer. Excuse me for going back in time like that. These are the villains. Now, this is what we see in our world, but let me take you now to a picture I see in the Bible. In the Bible, there were superheroes that really had super strength really had gifts who fought against the darkness of this world. It wasn't make-believe. It was real. There's Moses against Pharaoh. You know the battle that waged there? The darkness of his life. There was Joseph and I, which he, against Potiphar's wife. That was a battle. He won, by the way, he just took off. There was David against Goliath. There was Gideon against the Midianites. Then there was Samson against the Philistines. There was Elijah against the prophets of Baal. Good versus evil. Nehemiah against Sambalot. These people, and there's tons more in the Bible, these were truly superheroes who had superpowers. From on high. Now in this church, I see superpowers. Realize that? Have you ever thought of yourself that way? But in this church, I see superpowers. For you see at salvation, 
And I look at my own life, and you can also agree with me as you look at your life as well. At salvation, when I came to Christ, I was weighted down. I was so deeply disturbed. I was in sin, and I knew I was in sin. I was paralyzed because of it. When I discovered that Jesus loved me, and when I opened up my heart and said, God, I give you my life. I give you my future. I give you my heart. I invite you to come in. Suddenly, I was free to fly. I was free to move forward. And I felt like I could jump to the moon. I remember how different I felt on October 1974 in a hotel room in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Never again was the same. And then... At salvation, God promised the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, you shall receive power from on. When the Spirit comes within you, you shall receive power. At salvation, he cleanses you and sets you free. Acts chapter 2, he fills you with his Holy Spirit. This Spirit was supposed to explode within us. He deposits the spirit within us at salvation. And then he goes on to say that spirit is going to equip you. It's going to empower you. And that is why in this church I can see superpowers. Having superpowers now is one thing. But it takes action to become a hero. Now what if they would have stayed in Acts chapter 2? What if they would have stayed there? I don't know what would have happened. What are we doing with our superpowers? What are we doing with our salvation? What are we doing with our experience with with Jesus? What are we doing when the whole with the Holy Spirit comes to live within us? Having superpowers is one thing, but it takes action if you want to be a hero. Now, Leon Bloy said these words. I'm not totally sure I understand it, but it is worth saying. Let's just throw it out here. You can think about it. Any Christian who is not a hero, he says, is a pig. I don't know what that means. But it caused me to get stumped from it. What does he mean? I don't know whether to laugh or cry or be sad. or be, I don't know. Any Christian who is not a hero is a pig, he says. See, superpowers were not given for doing nothing. Superpowers were given for you and I from on high from God so that we could be heroes. See, loving your church means using and contributing your God-deposited <coughs> superpowers with a team player mindset so the church may grow up, so the church may grow out, so the church may impact its world. The little Sunday school course comes to mind. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. In my second church in Watchers, we'd sing, let it shine all over Watchers, let it shine all over Watchers, a little town of 2,000 people. When we were in Thompson on New Year's Eve, every New Year's Eve we did for many years, everyone got a candle when they came to church. And then we would close out the old year, bring in the new year by, by singing, I forget the name of that song now, but it wasn't This is the Light of Mine, it was an updated version of something to do with light, which is good. Doing, doing, and so we, we would... Light a candle. Light your world, that was. Like, go, light, go light your world. And everybody had candles. And everybody was praying. This could be dangerous. I never thought of it back then. It's very dangerous. Everybody, little children, everybody having all these candles. And we could go out in a blaze of glory right now. But when all those lights, and I would, now I'll never forget watching the darkness in that sanctuary and everyone's light, everyone's candle being lit. And suddenly everything was aglow. And I got the best picture of all from standing on the platform and looking down over the sea of people, seeing all the candles. We have a light. Our little light of ours can shine brightly as we bring it together, as we contribute, as we bring it and commune together in fellowship. Our light becomes a beacon. Our light becomes a a lighthouse for those who are out in troubled waters of, of life. And they see the huge light and they gravitate to it. They come to the shorelines, and they discover that Jesus Christ wants to transform them. Seems right to me.
You have superpowers. They're called spiritual gifts. Let me take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know, when I look at that word, uninformed, I'm reminded of the, when I, when I stood beside at the head of the grave of um, Abe Martins this past week. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul also says those words. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed. And then he goes on to talk about the rapture. He's going to talk about the saints who have fallen asleep, those that have passed away. Don't grieve like the rest of people that have no hope. And so here he uses it again in relation to the gifts of the Spirit. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. But I want you to know about them. Let's read on, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Notice the words, different kinds. What on earth does that mean? It means they're not the same. Pretty deep, isn't it? It means they're not the same. What does the word, notice the word distributes. He distributes them. What does that mean? It means that they have been given out. They've been dished out. They've been delivered. This is what I love about the church. Have you noticed we're not the same? Have you noticed how different we are? Our tastes are totally different. Our styles are, some of you would say, I'd never wear that thing he wears. That's okay. You're not me and I'm not you. You might say, I would never wear my hair so short. That's okay. But we're so different. Styles are different. Our fashion is different. We talk different. My son, Matthew, he's a, he, I don't know what else to say, except he's kind of like one of those computer geek guys. You know, so he hibernates in the base building apps, and I go down there, I see his screens and stuff. I don't understand any of it. That's what he does. He's a computer whiz, and, and so guess what? When I've got a computer problem, I don't go to a mechanic. I go to my son. But he's in the house all the time. In fact, my neighbor didn't even know I had a son. <laughs> the other day, well, maybe two or three weeks ago, where my wife and I are sitting out on the deck having our coffee, and my son Matthew makes his way out of the house. Hey, Matthew, I never, you know, what are you doing out here? He comes out and he says, where did we get that tree? And I said, I, I planted that 14 years ago. Like, this is a huge tree now. Green ash. Well, you got to get out more, I said. But you see, we're just different. I'm a car guy. He got a problem with his car, he comes to Papa. I got a problem with my computer, I go to him. Now, Pastor, let's talk about Pastor Vern now for a minute. He's a runner. He's a marathon. I never understand. I'm sorry. I just don't understand it. I can say that. He's got longer legs than me. I got shorter legs. I couldn't run no marathon. But he's a marathon runner. I have great respect for marathon runners. But I can't do it. It's not me. I run to the fridge. I run, to, <laughs> run to the couch. I run. Where's Lana? Where's the remote? Can you get it for me? I can't get up right now. Brings it to me. But you see, we're so different. Now, Pastor Vern, let's talk a little bit more. He's not fussy about cars. I love cars. He's not fussy about them. You ever see that green bomb he drives around? Green or gray? It's all hammered up. It's looked like it's been a demolition derby. Honestly, it's all hammered up. He drives by me, squeak, 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 squeak. Fix that thing, why don't you? He's not into cars. It's not his thing. It's mine, though. Now that wonderful demolition card is in my yard for the winter being stored. Every morning I get up and I'll see it. That gray neon thing in my yard. But see how different we are? I respect him running. He respects me loving working on cars. We're so different. We're so unique. But the marvelous thing is that God made us. Isn't that marvelous? 
that he tells us how to look at ourselves in the Bible. He tells us how to look in the mirror. He tells us how to treat one another. He tells us how to encourage and build up. We're so unique. And I'm looking at people in front of me that are so unique and so special. God's handprint is on you. God created you. God made you. There are no cookie cutter saints of God. Nobody has the same giftings. We're all different. We're so unique. And get this, your unique gift is not for your good, but for the common good. Not just for you. Verse 7 says that's for the common good. I love Paul's words that in Acts chapter 15, 28, he says it seemed good to us and the Holy, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. What a great line. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Common good, mentality thinking. We always need to be asking, what is good for the church? What is good for the family? What is good for the body of Christ? So what has been distributed to you by the Spirit is to serve others with. So Paul gives us a working document to ponder over. I'm not going to read it. There's no time for that today. But 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 7 to 11, read it when you go home. This is not an exhaustive list. There are other places in the Bible that speak to us and tell us about gifts, but we can ponder over them. But this is where we ought to sit back and, and prayerfully say, God, here's these gifts you're speaking of in this particular passage, and just ponder over them. Someone said that there are as many gifts in the church as there are needs. So let me give you some things that I know. Number one, here's what I know. God chose a gift, slash S, gifts. You may have more than one for you. It's not, do I have, but your question should be to God in prayer, what do I have? Not do I, but what is it that I have? Romans 12 and 6 says we have different gifts according to the grace that was given to us. Paul goes on to say that whatever that gift is, you need to use it and not shelve it. When you go home, read the rest of this passage, Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. Read it on. We don't apply to God and say, God, I wonder, could you give me this gift? That's not the way it operates. You don't apply for spiritual gifts, for these superpower gifts that God wants to give you. God just distributes them because he knows you. He created you. He made you. He knows you better than you know yourself. In fact, he knows what you can do when you think you can't do it. He knows what he gifted you with. And so, we shouldn't try to use someone else's gift. We really shouldn't. And sometimes we do. I wish I had that gift. Go and get your own gift. And go and find out, pray to God, say, God, what is it you want me to do? Find out for yourself what is your gift. Don't go to someone else and say, but if I only had that gift, the door is open. Why is that open? Hello? We should be happy with the gift we have been given by God. God never wants us to be jealous. Now, I got something with me. Here's a toothbrush. Gifts are like a toothbrush. The gifts that God has given you are like a toothbrush. How are they like a toothbrush? Everyone should have one. Agreed? And use it regularly. In fact, you can have a couple of them. Do you want to use mine this morning? No, you see. And I don't want to use yours. Everyone ought to have a toothbrush, and we ought to use it regularly, regularly. But we should never try to use someone else's toothbrush. It doesn't work. Your toothbrush is for you, not for someone else. And that's the same with gifts. Your gifts are for you. You should never be jealous and want someone else's. Number two, here's, here is something else I know. Your gift is powered by the Spirit. We all have natural abilities. We all have natural talents. But I'm speaking about an ability that when exercised, astounds you and astounds others. Haven't you been to the place at times when you said, this is just not me? 
Whatever it is, God just comes down in a moment and things happen. You say something or you prophesy or you share a word of exhortation and you say, this is just not me. It's the Spirit. It's the Spirit. When the Spirit is at work, there's an operation that takes place in a whole new dimension. It's the Spirit that gives light. It's the Spirit that gives sight. It's the Spirit that does the impossibilities. It's the Spirit that penetrates. It's the Spirit that confirms. And these spiritual gifts are led by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, and sustained by the Spirit. And the Spirit can do far more than natural could ever do. Spirit-led love can do far more than natural-led love. Spirit-led mercy can do more. Spirit-led encouragement can do more. Spirit-led honor can do more. Spirit-led giving can do more. And so all these gifts that God has given to the church, we say, what is the purpose? What is the purpose? Ephesians chapter 4. Let me just read it. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every little wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect, every respect the mature body of, of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each part, as each person in the pew sees themselves as having superpowers and wants to become heroes as led by the Holy Spirit. Each part does its work. That's why I've said the church is like no other gathering on the face of the earth. There isn't. The potential in the church is mind-boggling of what God can do. Number three. I think it's a good point to make that it's okay to explore. It's okay to explore and go into discovery land. You may be here this morning and trying to wrestle with what, I'm just not sure what my gifts are. It's okay to explore. Many, many years ago, uh, as a child, I grew up in crusaders. And then the, the guys were crusaders, the men were, uh, the ladies were called missionettes. And after, when I gave my heart to the Lord at age 18, I knew that God would want me to be doing something, and so I thought I'd explore. Maybe I should be a crusader leader. And so I said, I'll, I'll try it. So I tried it for a month, and discovered that's not for me. And so it's the same with you. Try something. We never want you to feel that, well, I'm going to explore being an usher. I'm going to explore being on the sound. I'm going to explore being in kids' church. I'm going to explore being in nursery. We never want you to feel that when you volunteer for something that we expect you to be there for 20 years. We don't expect that at all. We expect you to be there for 30 years, not 20. But, you know, just explore. Just try it on. See if it's a good fit. You know that if you get out late at night, you're out shopping, the local store, buying groceries, you get in your car, start up your car, you put on the lights. If you just sit there, the light will never show you. You'll never see nothing. You got to put the car in gear, and as you drive forward, guess what? It's an amazing thing about your headlights. They will go ahead of you. It's an amazing thing. In fact, ours is so special that you turn the steering wheel, the headlights go that way too. So you... As you move, you see the light. As you move, the, it becomes illuminated. So you've got to put yourself in gear and say, here's what I'm going to try. Here's what I'm going to explore. And if it fits for you and it works for you, then God bless you in that ministry. If it's not, someone else will feel that and you can move on to something else. Number four, it's okay. It's good to ask others. Why not go to someone who you trust? Go to someone who has your best interests at heart. Go to them and say, what do you see in me? 
I really advise you to do it. It's a good, it's good. Go to the right person. But say, what do you see in me? When God speaks about gifts, spiritual gifts, and he wants to distribute them, what gifts do you think God has for me? What am I good at? And then say, will you pray for me that I may discover what my gifts are? Number five, and lastly, here's something else I know, that you have a superpower team. It's called the church. You have a superpower team. It's called the church. Remember the A-team. Maybe that was back in the 80s. Now I, I'm back there anyway somewhere. It was an action-adventure TV series, another show that I really liked. Each, was, each person, I think it was four of them, e each one was so different. Boy, were they different. But when each one contributed their gifts, in fact, I'm watching these car shows. I love car shows, and Misfit Garage is one of the ones I love. And last week, they, they got a, he was saying, when we all put our gifts together, we can build supercars. They can. And so this A-team, as they all put their different abilities together, they came up with wonderful things. They made it happen. At the end of the show, George Papard would say, oh, I just love it when a plan comes together. That's the church. We love our church. We just love it when a plan comes together. Oh, the potential of the church. When every person sees that they are needed. When every person sees and becomes aware of the fact that they can serve. One of the greatest ways to make this church your church is to get involved. And say, this is what I can do for the glory of God. And watch God use you. Let me close by reading a scripture that's found in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's Paul's words, Paul's words. So God, today we have been declaring how much we love our church. When Jesus, you came upon this earth, you, you died for people. People are the church. You died for the lost. You died for the hurting. You died for those that are bound by sin. You died for those that were so confused and so wrecked, couldn't find their way, you died for them. And God, when we find salvation so rich and so free, so marvelous, then we find a church that we want to associate with. And God, I thank you for all the churches in our city. But God, we find one that we feel, this is where I should be. Then we come in and we take our seats. And then we hear about gifts, dreams, potential of the church. We hear what God wants to do through us. Then we get up from our seats and we become involved. And we can be have superpowers. We can have superpowers and become heroes as we use them. So God, I thank you for this fall season as we begin to move forward into the ministries. We have no idea, God, all that you desire to do through us. But God, we're willing to run with you and want to run with you. I pray, God, for those that are still searching, trying to find their way as it pertains to gifts. I pray you'd enlighten them and show them. In his name we ask it. Amen.
If you'd like to receive ministry as we conclude with a song, step out, make your way to the front, and we'll pray for you. Would you stand with me? Presence is all I need. It's all.